Today is all about Affinity Photo for the iPad. For a long time, photo editor apps for mobile devices were less than stellar. And it made sense. Mobile meant phones, and no one was really looking to create a full-blown photo composite off of their phone. But even now, with the iPad being so advanced that some people argue that it could be used as a standalone laptop, photo editing apps are still not much more than lightweight versions of their original counterparts, offering some filters, color corrections, maybe a bit of liquify. But Affinity Photo for the iPad is unique in that it offers the full power of Affinity Photo, not a wimpied, watered-down version. This even includes PSD importing and exporting. I like to use the app as a way to create quick mockups of images, a photo compositor's version of a sketch, if you will. But even more than that, the app is ideal for creating on the go. Long airplane or train rides go by so much quicker when I know I'm working and getting stuff done, as opposed to sitting bored out of my mind, trying not to focus on the stranger's elbow that totally doesn't need to be touching me right now. Instead, I can amuse myself in creating a high fashion meets punk rock glass situation, like the one we'll be putting together here today. So let's take a look at how you can get the full Affinity Photo experience in a much smaller package and all on the go. But first, let me tell you where all of the images we'll be using today can be found, so that you can follow along right alongside me. EnvatoElements.com is my go-to place for stock photos, fonts, and graphics, for both photo and video editing. You can check out all the links for the images I'll be using today in the video description below. So, the first thing I always recommend when jumping into a new program is to set up your interface and settings. And while the interface is nowhere near as fluid compared to the desktop version, there are still a lot of personal preferences you can set including your undo limit, going up to an insane 2,000 undos, how often you'd like things to autosave, great for those of you like me who live that 10% or less of battery life life, your language and your default save location, I highly recommend iCloud Drive, your background gray level, I like to keep things nice and dark myself, and you will also find left-handed mode for all you lefties out there. So just take a quick look through and get everything nice and set up to your liking. Next, we will want to set up our canvas by pressing the plus icon found in the right hand corner of the Affinity Photo app's splash screen. From here, you can choose from several different options, including creating a whole new document, which will bring up your typical options of size, color, and some document presets. You can also import directly from your clipboard or from the photos saved to your iPad, or you can import from the cloud, which is what I personally find to be the easiest. To do this, you will have to have iCloud set up, which you likely already have, or at the very least have it installed on one of your Apple products by default. But if not, it's a very straightforward process. And for me, the easiest way to share files between my PC and my iPad. But how you go importing depends not only on your personal workflow, but on the image you will be creating. In this case, we will be creating a portrait photo effect. So I want to start with opening my portrait photo. Now, Affinity Photo for the iPad keeps it very simple with its gestures, keeping things fairly standard and intuitive. You zoom in and out by placing two fingers on the screen and then pinching your standard uh, smartphone pinching gesture. However, you can also adjust the zoom by going into the navigator found on the right-hand side of the screen here. You will see a few preset percentages uh, as well as the fit to screen option to set everything back to default. To pan, simply take one finger, touch and drag, making sure the view tool is selected. Now, if you have a tool selected like the paintbrush tool, you will want to use two fingers to pan instead of one so that you won't apply the actual tool. Now to rotate, you will first have to go into the navigator as rotate is turned off by default. Once turned on, you can rotate by using the rotation dial here, 
um, within the navigator or by making a pinch and swivel motion. To reset your canvas's angle, click the rotation dial, input zero, and hit OK. Redo and undo are also controlled using gestures. You can undo by doing a two finger tap onto the canvas and you can redo by doing a three finger tap onto the canvas. These are my personal favorite gestures and I find them very intuitive. Finally, if you hold down onto the canvas with one finger, a quick context menu will open up uh, containing your duplicate, delete, cut, and copy options. There are also tool specific gestures as well, which we will cover while we cover the tool itself. But most come down to a simple drag, swipe, or tap. No magic fingers needed. Let's go into the options located in the file menu. That would be the three dots in the upper left hand corner. We are going to go to Place from Cloud and bring in this glass texture here. Remember, all the photos you see can be downloaded at ImbottleElements.com. With that place, let's look at how we rotate, resize, and move around different layers. First, you will want to make sure the Move tool is selected. To move a layer around, hold your finger inside of the image and pan around. Remember, if you want to pan the canvas and not move the actual layer, you will use two fingers instead of one. To resize layers, you want to tap and drag the control nodes, the blue dots, found around the image. Some images and layers will by default constrain, keeping its original aspect ratio, whereas some layers won't. Here we see this one does. Whatever the case, you can use a one finger modifier to toggle it on or off. So while resizing the image with one finger, use your other finger to press down on the screen. Rotate by holding the top control handle and swiveling to either the left or right. If you need more precise control, you can open up the transform panel found on the right hand side. Here you can adjust the order, flip and rotate Adjust the dimensions by either tapping to change the numbers manually or by swiping up or down on the dimension dials. And you can also fine tune the position and adjust the anchor points from here as well. Now let's take a closer look at layers. I'll run through the basics real quick, then we can jump into the good stuff. Trade a layer by opening up the layer panel found on the right hand side, and then tap the plus sign. From here, you can create a pixel layer or a fill layer, as well as layer masks and groups. Let's hold off on those for now. I'm going to create a fill layer set to a very dark purple, along with an empty pixel layer. Reorder a layer by tapping and dragging. To reorder multiple layers at once, use a swipe gesture on any layers you'd like to move. The same to deselect the layers. To select multiple layers at once, select a layer and then use two fingers to select another layer. All the layers in between the two selected layers will then become selected themselves. You can also group things together by selecting the layers you want to group and then making a pinch in gesture. You can then ungroup the layers by selecting the group and pinching outwards. Alternatively, you can also hit the group layers icon found inside the layers panel to the left of the create layers icon. I much prefer this as my tiny baby fingers don't like doing the pinch out gesture. It's a me problem. <laughs> Duplicate a layer by double tapping the layer on the canvas uh, that you want to duplicate, holding down two fingers and then dragging with your other hand. To get all of the fine tuning layer options such as opacity and layer modes, select the layer you want to adjust and then click on the layer options icon in the layers panel, shown as three dots inside of a circle. You can also choose to lock a layer and rename a layer inside these layer options. Now, one of my favorite tools in both Affinity Photo and Photoshop are the layer modes. They are endlessly useful 
and so they are an absolute must-have. You can adjust the layer mode by clicking normal and then selecting from the list that appears. Alternatively, however, you can swipe through each layer mode individually by using a swiping gesture over top of the layer mode options. This is great for when you are just playing around and want to see multiple different options without having to select each one by hand. So adjustment layers are a go-to artist tool for non-destructive editing and again, one of my must-haves. To access the adjustment layers, click on the icon of the three-circle pyramid found on the right here. A list of all your adjustments will come up. Let's start with a brightness contrast adjustment layer. When tapped, the options available to the adjustment layer you choose will come up towards the bottom of the screen. To adjust the settings, either swipe on the various setting dials or you can tap them to input the amounts manually. Each adjustment layer will have its own individual options. I'm going to go ahead and clip this brightness contrast layer into my glass layer by dragging and dropping. All of your filters can be found directly below your adjustment layers. Uh, like with adjustment layers, all filters will have their own filter specific options that will appear at the bottom of the screen. Along with the live preview, you can also choose to have a split preview by hitting the split icon giving you a before and after view of your photo, which is a very nice touch. I'm a big fan. Next, onto selections, extractions, and of course, layer masks. First, we need to switch into the selection persona. This is where, surprise, surprise, we will find all of our selection and extraction based tools. You have all the classic tools to choose from. You have uh, your smart selection tool, your freehand tool, all of your marquee tools, your flood selection tool, and of course your color select tool. I'm going to use the smart selection tool to take a quick selection of my model here. You can see all of the selection options towards the bottom of the screen, including whether you want to add or subtract from a selection, as well as the brush width. Of course, now we have to refine our selection. Hit the refine selection tool found at the very bottom of the toolbar. Adjust your brush and then drag across the edges of any hair, cloth, or anything really that needs to be selected. This tool works exactly the same in the iPad version as it does in the desktop version. Once you are happy, you will want to choose your output. In my case, new layer with mask. And then hit apply. I'm also going to go ahead and drag my fill layer from earlier below my newly masked layer as it will serve as our portrait's new background. If you want to add a layer mask without creating a selection, all you have to do is choose the layer you want to add a mask to, hit the plus icon found in the layers panel, and then select mask layer. Just like the selection tools, all of the Liquify tools and options have their very own persona. The Liquify persona works the same as most, if not all, Liquify tools, which I like. You push and pull on the grid, adjusting the Liquify brush using the settings towards the bottom of the screen. Adjust the mesh display by clicking the mesh icon found on the right hand side of the canvas. You can also change the color of the grid or hide it completely as it can be pretty distracting. All of your different liquify tools can be found to the left, allowing you to push, pull, and twist in every direction imaginable. Then there's also the freeze and thaw tools, which despite their intriguing names are just your typical liquify masks. Freeze makes it so the area that is frozen, seen in red, won't be affected by any liquify tools, and thaw erases the frozen mask, allowing that area to be liquefied again. Let's take a quick look at the basics of the paintbrush tool. First, we have the brush categories, which will hold all of Affinity Photo's default brushes. You can switch throughout the brushes by going towards the top and hitting basic, which is what your brushes are set to by default. 
Again, once you have the brush tool selected, all of its settings will pop up towards the bottom of the screen. Here you have your width, opacity, flow, hardness, and color. From here, you can paint using your finger or the Apple Pencil if you need more precise details. I do not currently use the pencil, however, I do see myself grabbing it sometime in the future. And of course, you can import your own brushes. Do this by tapping the three-lined icon on the upper right of the Layers panel and then choosing Import Brushes. From here, you will choose wherever you have your brushes saved. You can drop them right into iCloud Drive, for instance, and then just tap to import. To further adjust the brush, beyond just your typical size and flow, all you have to do is tap and hold on a brush. Choose Edit, and all of its possible settings will come up. If you want to then reset the brush back to default, you can tap, hold, and then choose Reset. And finally, as a little trick, hit the pen icon found towards the top of the brush panel to keep the brush panel open. This is handy if you switch your brushes around a lot, as the constant opening and closing can get incredibly annoying. Finally, at the end of every work session, you are probably going to do one of two things, save or export. Affinity Photo for the iPad can save a document in one of two ways. It'll first autosave all on its own, saving the file internally within the app's memory, which is great for maybe one, two, or three projects. But things are going to start piling up real fast and eating up your iPad's memory. So the second option is to save a copy of the file by tapping the document menu and choosing save a copy. From here, you can rename your file and then decide where to save out to. In my case, iCloud Drive. This will save as an Infinity Photo file and can then be opened in the desktop version of Affinity Photo without having to convert or merge any layers. This is what makes it so ideal for travel. I can start a rough draft while on a long train ride and then refine and finish up on my own PC once I get back. I can even then convert an AP file to a PSD and finish things up in Photoshop if I so desired. Which, if I'm being honest, I usually do. But if your image is all finished, you might as well export it using your iPad. Go to the document menu and choose export to bring up all of your exporting options. You have all the exporting options the desktop version has, including, as I mentioned, exporting to PSD. The settings will change depending on the format you choose. So once you have all of your settings set, you need to hit OK to choose once again where you want the images to be saved. For me, I can choose to save either straight to my iPad's photos or my iCloud Drive. Once exported, you are good to go. And there you have it, a basic rundown of putting together a photo composite in Affinity Photo iPad, just covering the basics, getting you started. If you are already experienced or even just someone who knows their way around the desktop version of Affinity Photo, pretty okay, you will have absolutely no problem diving in headfirst straight into the iPad version of Affinity Photo. It's the same program, but with touch. And carrying around an iPad is maybe a tad less cumbersome than a full-blown workstation desktop with a dual screen setup. So if you like this video and would like to see more, go ahead and hit that like button. Subscribe if you aren't already, and don't forget to click the little bell icon to be notified of any and all new and inspiring videos. And if you are looking to learn even more, why not check out some of the other excellent tutorials that Envato Touch Plus has to offer. I'm Abby Esparza, see you next time.